Good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, start the First Nations info session on uh, wildfire preparedness and response. Uh, Casey LaRochelle here. I am work at Finesse in strategic partnerships, and I'm happy to uh, support these information sessions. I'm zooming in from Sanaimo territory, uh, where I grew up in Nanaimo, though I'm Quag youth from the uh, Kitimat band up on the north coast. Um, we're hoping to have a good presentation today. And as always, we will start with um, a round of introductions. And if you can uh, introduce yourself, your name and any expectations you have of this meeting or a question that you have about wildfire preparedness and response, then we'll try to make a note of it and see if the presentations can answer. Um, so I'll call people out on my screen as I see them. And uh, Juan, you're you're the first person on my screen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yerik Chirik, Kumdana Bunsu, buenos dias. My name is Juan, Juan Sereño. Um, I carry the name Wichu from the Lacacmac territory. I'm proud of us serving uh, Natalie within First Nation in the capacity of Emergency Operations Center Director. I can see my partner in crime um, on the screen. Um, I have asked uh, Serena Green to speak uh, briefly about uh, Natalie within uh, when it's time for us uh, to make a presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to have a wholesome uh, conversation regarding uh, how are we going to be responding um, to this fire season that is already starting? Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Jamie Svensson. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jamie Svensson. I'm the First Nations Emergency Services Response Team Leader. And uh, well, I'm really happy to be here and do a short presentation for you today. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Cochran. See, a long time no talk. <laughs> um, Stephen Cochran here, community manager, name is First Nation. Um, looking forward to finding out some more information, especially with these concerns with the snowpack issues, the water shortages the that will be coming. Ooh, I don't know what that was, but. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, nice to see a lot of the friendly faces on the screen today. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Moses Towell. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Moses Towell. I'm the resource and, um, resource and development manager for the Utah Pacific Tribe, but I'm also the emergency program coordinator responsible for the emergency program here. So nice to meet everybody and see some, some uh, faces I haven't seen in a while. Thank you very much. Uh, Serena Green. Good morning, everyone. I don't know if you could all see me, but um, my name is Serena Green. I'm from Not Within First Nations. Um, Notly means where the salmon return. I work for uh, Not Within as climate change coordinator here. And I was part of the EOC last year. So the EOC helps a lot with the... Uh, the fires, they helped with COVID. So I just wanted to say good morning to you all. And I'm really proud to be working here. I also work on missing and murdered indigenous women. So um, I hope you all have a good day. Not like um, the firefighters here do an awesome job and we have the only First Nations woman crew leader in our territory. So I'm very proud of that. I'm very, very proud of that. It's led by a woman. So that makes me so proud. Thank you very much, Serena. Uh, Zaina West. Dana West, and I'm the Health and Safety Emergency Preparedness Officer for the Mochat Machalat First Nations. Um, expectations of this meeting, I just want to learn as much as I can about wildfire preparedness. Um, of course, we're getting really nervous about it coming up here, and um, 
a question I have is uh, I'm trying to set up wildfire or wildland firefighter training here. However, I don't have a whole lot of uh, volunteers from the nation who want to join. So I was just wondering if it's possible that I can invite other First Nations to send some people so we could fill up a course and have mm. them take it here. That's it. Thank you, Zaina. And I think we can cover that in one of the presentations. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Lalonde. Good morning, I'm Chris Lalonde. I represent Halfway River First Nation as their uh, that, that manager of emergency services. I'm also their fire chief and community paramedic. So they're in the process of starting up a fire department, including wildfire response. So I'm just curious and looking forward to seeing uh, what information you guys can share with me. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Erica from OIB. Hi, Erica Louie from the Osiris Indian Band. Uh, just uh, we're updating our emergency plan for the Osiris Indian Band. So just uh, listening in on what information can be useful and uh, and helpful with developing and updating our plan. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Bruce McDonald. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Bruce McDonald from Lataco Dene in Quinnell. Um, Lab manager here, just looking forward to uh, everything going on here today. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Deborah Douglas, EPC GM. Yes, good morning. This is my first time in joining one of your meetings. Thank you very much for the invite. And yes, looking forward to the information uh, gathering today. Uh, and at GM, we've only had the warming station and cooling station. We don't have as much threat of uh, wildfires as some nations do so but looking forward to all the information thank you very much everyone thank you deborah very nice to meet you virtually um paul mccarthy Good morning i'm paul mccarthy i am the emergency program coordinator here at uh, williams lake first nation just happy to try to be useful today <laughs> out of boy paul thank you Uh, Peter McDonald. Yeah, thanks very much, Casey. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Peter McDonald, Southwest Regional Manager for the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, also known as EMCR. Um, I'm here on behalf of Ian Cunnings, our Senior Director of Regional Operations, who unfortunately can't join us right now, uh, but very respectfully and gratefully uh, acknowledging I'm calling in from uh, the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples and here at our EMCR offices in the Southwest. Uh, this includes the Semiami, Katsi and Kwanlin First Nations who have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial. Very grateful to Finesse for hosting and inviting us to this meeting to learn and share information together. Thanks. Thanks, Peter, and thanks for stepping in when, uh, when Ian couldn't be here. Uh, Ed Attridge. Yeah, thanks, Casey. Ed Attridge, uh, Stellatin First Nation Emergency Services Coordinator. Of course, we're very active uh, with our fire department and uh, various other things that are going on in the community, the CRI program, fire smarting, etc. So we're preparing best we can for the upcoming fire season, uh, which people are definitely nervous about uh, in our end of the planet here. And so just uh, been to a number of Casey's meetings, looking forward to what he's got lined up here. Always informative, always good. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Farzad Dian. Sorry if I got that backwards. No, that was right. Hello, everyone. My name is Farzad Dian from uh, Blueberry River First Nations. Uh, actually, Anthony Puskup is on uh, online now. He's looking after all our emergencies, and I'm just uh, the engineer with the band. So I'm just uh, looking forward to this meeting. If there's anything, I can be of any assistance. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, the one and only Yannick Lapierre. <laughs> Yannick, if you're able to. Yes. Hi. Sorry about that. My. Is this working? Not sure. Yeah, we everyone? can hear you. Perfect. Um. Good morning. Can you see me? Also, I I can't. See. Okay, we're good. Morning. Uh, my name is Yannick Lapierre. I work for Indigenous Services Canada in the Emergency Management Unit. 
I'm one of the program advisor for Vancouver Island and coastal region. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll be here for if you guys have any questions related to uh, ISK or related to Vancouver Island, um, broader questions on that. So now I'm doing a presentation too, apparently. So <laughs> thank you, Yannick. Uh, Krista, EMCR. Hi, sorry, I'm uh, using the web browser. My Zoom had to update, so I'm not quite used to it. Uh, I'm Krista with EMCR. I'm the partnership coordinator from the Southwest region, and I'm just here to listen in today. Thank you, Krista. Uh, Trudy Peterson with Finesse. Sorry. <laughs> we, we can hear you, Trudy. Oh, sorry, I don't know how to make my camera work. Um, <clears throat> Trudy Peterson uh, from Finesse, uh, working in uh, the preparedness department, here to listen in on uh, first station questions and um, you know where the gaps are. Thanks. Thanks, Trudy. David Schott. Hey, Casey, good to see you. Thanks for the invite here. David Schott, regional manager for Vancouver Island Coastal Team, uh, living in community with Newhawk Territory over in Bella Pula, and just an appreciation to be invited and living here. Thanks, Casey. Good to see you, David. Uh, Brett Oppel. To secure it, my name is Brett Upgill, and I'm the fire and emergency manager with uh, Yakutak Nuclear. Um, I was tasked to start a fire department here <laughs> for the uh, Yakutak Nuclear, and I've been at it almost two years, it's going pretty well. Thanks. Very good to hear. Uh, Samantha Double, EMCR. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Samantha Dovell. Uh, I am one of the new emergency management technicians with the Vancouver Island Coastal Region at EMCR, the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, uh, calling in today from our office. So we're on beautiful Wasanic territory and super grateful to get to work here. Um, but yeah, just here to observe and learn and get knowledge going into my new role. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Allison Lohman with Finesse. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Allison Lohman. I'm with Finesse and I'm with the preparedness team. Thank you, Allison. Brendan Mercer. Hey, good morning, everyone. Brendan Mercer, Decision Support Manager, calling in from the beautiful Shwetmagulu territory, uh, more specifically at, at our office in the Kamloops of Shwetmag. Good morning. Uh, looking forward to participating and presenting a little bit about some of the advanced uh, preparedness supports and mapping and interesting tools that we have at Finesse to help communities understand disaster risk and the other priorities of emergency management. Thank you. Uh, Christina Kelly. Lisa Kayokiet, Apkin Niskit, Hugaktik, Christina Kelly, who in Tanaka, who Gaki Gaki, Akiskanok, who Sao Sawagani, Stalo Lakamo. Uh, my name is Christina Kelly. Good day, everyone. I hope you're having a good week. I currently work and live on Lakamo First Nation land um, as the Emergency Program Coordinator and the Emergency Support Services Director, uh, and I'm part of ESS for Nations, and we are creating a fire team this year. Here, we've onboarded FireSmart, so I'm looking forward to today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, C. House with Finesse. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Carmichael. I'm a, a data analyst here at Finesse, calling in from the um, uh, Songhees and was uh, uh traditional territory. <laughs> Sorry, Carmichael, I I blanked out with your last name. Um, Laura Antoine. Uh, good morning. My name is Laura Antoine. I'm the Coldwater Indian Band Administrator and uh, Deputy Fire Chief. I'm basically just here to listen in and um, uh, learn a little bit more. We're lucky we're in the Nicola Valley and we really experienced major 
major fire. We did have it at July Mountain in our back door. So we're trying to figure out ways to keep our community safe with a uh, lack of water coming. Cooks, Jim. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Dale Gans Gansveld. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dale Gansveld. I am living and working at Sumas First Nation, and I'm the Community Recovery Assistant. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ricky Chowdhury. Hi, everyone. I'm Ricky Chowdhury. I'm actually just joining uh, Quetzino First Nations as a um, economic advisor, but was asked to join this call and possibly help out with emergency preparedness for Coal Harbor in Northern North Island, North Vancouver Island. Thank you for joining us. Um, Jim Scott, EMCR. Gonna try Jim coming up on video here. Uh, we've been having issues with him connecting through voice. Uh, Jim Scott is the new regional manager for the North Island uh, area of responsibility for emergency management and climate readiness under Vancouver Island Coastal Team. Thanks for that, David. Mariah Mund. Oh, you're on mute. Um... If you're not able to unmute, we can uh, circle back. Casey, Mariah's put something in the chat. Okay, I'm just checking the chat now. She's in a shared meeting space today. Uh, Mariah Mudd, she works with the Emergency Planning Secretariat as the Resilience Coordinator, and she resides on the traditional lands of the Coquitlam First Nations. Great to be here today. Thank you, Mariah. Um, Jim Scott, EMCR, or did I already call you, Jim? Sorry, my, my boxes are moving here. I think I might have already called you. Uh, we'll go to Chris Ross with FNHA. Hello, good morning. My name is Chris Ross. I am the training and exercise specialist for the provincial uh, health emergency management team. I'm calling you today from the traditional and zero territory of the Spawnic, Muscogee, and Seattle Nations. Uh, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Um, James from Dididat. Hi, James Alfred Fothergill Brown here, calling from Dididat First Nation, uh, Emergency Services Coordinator. Big crowd today. I think it goes to show how much uh, we're concerned about uh, fire. Thanks for having this session. Yeah, and I think we have plenty of time. Usually we finish early, but we might go the distance today. Um, Michelle Jacobs, Finesse. Good morning, Michelle Jacobs. I work with Decision Support as a technical trainer and just here to absorb information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christelle Camille with Finesse. Good morning, everyone. Crystal Camille, Executive Assistant to uh, our DD at Vanessa. I'm from Stockholm Highland First Nation. I'm just here to learn from all the First Nations. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Randy Morgan. Hello, my name is Randy Morgan. I'm from the Gitwangak First Nation. I'm the Emergency Service Coordinator for Gitwangak and Manager for our fire department. Um, I'm happy to be here and join you guys and learn um, as we too are getting ready for fire season. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here and learn with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine King. My given name is Christine King. Um, I'm the Emergency Programs Coordinator for Sta Elis. I'm here just to listen in and learn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, John Forrest with EMCR. Good morning, uh, John Forrest. Uh, yeah, uh, I am with the uh, Vancouver Island Coastal Team. I'm a regional manager and uh, I support uh, Mid-Island communities and I'm calling in from the beautiful territories of uh, 
the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Hosanic, and um, I'm uh, just uh, looking to uh, uh, get uh, information on um, uh, current state of preparedness uh, for First Nation communities for wildfire. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mandy Yantha. Mandy, if you're able to introduce yourself. And we can, oh, uh, she put in the chat that her mic isn't working. Um, there's Fred with a three for the E, Fred. If you're able to introduce yourself. FR3D. We can circle back. Um, Natasha Colbreth. Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Natasha Colbreth. I currently live in Iskut, BC, and it's my home nation of the Telten people. Um, I'm currently doing what everybody else is doing, is trying to get prepared for the season. Um, have a lot of concerns. As here in Iskit, we usually get quite a bit of snow, and right now we don't have very much. So I'm just on here to learn and make some contacts with some people and, yeah, just get prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Carson. Good morning, everyone. David Carson calling from Wasanich Territory. Uh, honored to be here, just uh, listening in on behalf of a, of a few clients. I see some of my uh, uh, compatriots on here. Uh, Michael Moses, um, just like everybody else, just sort of looking at uh, what's coming up, being prudent about the, the season uh, almost upon us or upon us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anthony Pusku. Uh, hello, um, Anthony Puskupi here. I'm with Blue Bear River First Nations. I'm the Fire Smart Coordinator and the Emergency Operations Coordinator as well. Um, we're just getting ready for next year or this year from last year's disaster, not once but twice. Um, just looking forward to seeing what we got planned for this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tully Wiseman. Well, yes, good morning, Casey and everyone. Um, Tully Wiseman, Emergency Planning and Response Manager for Cowichan Tribes. Um, like everybody here, I'm looking forward to this morning's session and gaining some information. So thank you. Thank you, Tully. Carrie Ann Lau. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Carrie Ann Lau, Senior Geoscientist at BGC Engineering, calling in from Moscow and Squamish and Sailor Tooth Territories. And I'll be presenting on uh after the wildfire so post wildfire uh risks thanks thank you so much carrie uh greg ambrosic greg if you're able to introduce yourself we can circle back uh robert cosma tng Hi there, I'm uh, Robert Cosmos, the service manager for um, the TNG communities, the Shukul Nation. Um, I'm just here to see what uh, all the other First Nation communities are doing for the parents. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Chris March. Uh, good morning, Casey, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Marsh. Uh, I'm an emergency management advisor for the Tanaka Nation Council, uh, and I'm calling in today from the uh, uh, territory of the Tanaka, uh, Silk, and Sinaix nations. Uh, and yeah, just like everyone else, just uh, here to be prepared and uh, hear some new information. Thanks. Thank you very much. We have a really good group here, a large group, but a good group. Um, Michael Sudfield. Sudfeld, sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Michael Sudfeld. I'm the office manager at Scalic First Nation. And I'm just here to listen. I uh, support most of the emergency management operations here. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, Sabrina Elliott, Couch and Tribes. Good morning, respected friends and family. I come from the Couchin Valley, born and raised here on Quetzin Territory. I am the emergency program admin specialist here at Couchin Tribes. I've been here for a few years. A lot of expertise in flooding. Um, my husband's worked at the Quetzal Forest Services for a number of years now, so I've got quite a bit of knowledge and firsthand experience of what the firefighters go through each season. And um, if it's one thing I've learned is knowledge is power, and the more people you know, the faster you're able to respond and be resilient. So. I feel this is great, Casey, on bringing everybody together to share what we know and to help each other in a time of need, as First Nations often do. Um, thank you for the invite, and I don't have any questions. Thank you so much. Great to see you here. Uh, Leah Brody from FNHA. Everyone, I don't know what I look like. Uh, I can't see my camera, but um, it's good to be here. I work as the operations specialist for our provincial health emergency management team with FNHA, and I'm lucky enough this morning to be calling in from my ancestral traditional territories of the Squamish people with shared lands with the Musqueam nations and Tsleil Waututh nations. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great to see FNHA here. Uh, Joe Kelly. If you're able to introduce yourself, Joe. Hi, sorry, Zoom, new to Zoom. Um, so Joe Kelly, I work with Indigenous Services Canada. I am also a program advisor for the Southwest uh, region. I'm just here to learn um, and also get uh, prepared for the upcoming season. Thank you very much. Uh, Josh McStravick. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Josh McStravick. I am an emergency management technician for Vancouver Island Coastal. Um, I am grateful to live and work on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen and Wissanik peoples. And yeah, I'm just using this time as a kind of an information gathering um, on kind of how to better support the region. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Albert Nicknacken. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, joining from Hacklip First Nations uh, out of the Statham Territory uh, located in, in and around Lillooet area. Uh, I'm the emergency program coordinator and fire smart coordinator as well. I will be finishing my application with Dan and Derek Andrews from Finesse. And I have quite a bit of things going planned for this, this next uh, three or four months. So yeah, I can inform you on how those things go. Thank you very much, Albert. Uh, Jackie Wilson. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jackie Wilson. I am the partnership coordinator uh, for EMCR out of the Northwest. Uh, grateful to reside on the traditional territory of the Wet'suwet'en people uh, in Smithers. And I am just here to hear how everybody is making out with preparedness and uh, see where we can help out. Thank you, Casey. Thank you very much. Uh, JC Gilbert, SFN. Good morning, I'm JC Gilbert. I work as an emergency management assistant for Soto First Nations. Um, just looking to see what the presenters have to say about wildfire response. Thank you very much. We're, we're almost at the end. We have a Really great group here. Um, Chris Jankowski. Good morning, Casey. Chris Jankowski, Director of Health Emergency Management for First Nations Health Authority. Um, coming today from the Coast Salish unceded ter territories. Uh, pleased to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Chris. Nanine Bjornsson. Hello, I'm Nanine in Quinnell with Lataco Today Nation. I'm just here to listen and learn. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeremiah Takla, Takla Nation.
Hi, good morning. My name is Jeremiah Lewis. I'm with Tackle Nation. Uh, just looking to connect and meet with everybody again to start making these connections before the summer. Um, last summer, we were incredibly busy and we're still busy right now, right? Responding to fires. So, um, nice to meet everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Jeremiah. Don Russell, ONA. You're able to introduce yourself, Don. Thank you for that. My name is Don Russell. I'm the Emergency Management Coordinator for the Okanagan Nation Alliance. I have uh, quite a few years in the emergency response business, and it is lovely to see all of my compatriots here from around the province. And thank you very much. I look forward to today's presentation. Thank you. Uh, Darren Robertson. Yeah. Uh, Darren Robertson here from West Mobile First Nations from the Treaty 8 Peace River area. Um, O&M manager, uh, emergency manager um, here for the for the uh, up, up and coming season and uh, to see what's new with flooding and wildfires, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Loretta Weingart. Good morning, everyone. My name is Loretta Weingart. I'm the Emergency Operations Coordinator for SCEDM. Um, I'm looking forward to the shared information and preparing for the new season. Thank you very much. Maurice Evans, OKIB. Maurice, if you're able to introduce yourself or we can circle back. Uh, we'll go along with um, Lyndon Baker, New Channel Travel Council. Uh, good morning. Yeah, uh, my name is Lyndon Baker. I'm the Emergency Planning Coordinator for New Channel Travel Council, and I'm really glad to participate in this and um, be involved with uh, learning with you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maurice, are you able to introduce yourself now? I am. Um, it's Morris Evans, uh, OKIB Emergency Program Coordinator, and uh, along with other than trying to uh, get some fire smart information out to community members on reserve, I am uh, just in the process of, uh, yeah, also getting ready for the season and also closely watching snowpacks and whatnot. So, yeah, thanks, Casey, and look forward to the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Jay. Weeb, why? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jay Weeb with uh, Skin Tie Nation here. I'm the emergency coordinator for the emergency management coordinator for the for the band. Uh, I've been at it for about a year and been working with uh, trying to set up a new EM plan uh, with the nest and stuff. So I'm just here to learn more about what I can do. Thank you very much. Um, Caitlin from Seychat, are you... Um able to join us again? I know you put in the chat. I am, yeah. Uh, Caitlin Minville, Sushot First Nation. Uh, I'm the Emergency Program Coordinator. I started in August of 2023. Um, like everyone, looking forward to getting some more information. It feels like we had flooding a few weeks ago, and now we're swinging in the other direction where the flowers are popping up and we're having a very, very early spring. So yeah, just looking to connect and learn more. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, has there been anyone who didn't have an opportunity to introduce themselves? Maybe uh, either raise hand or just uh, just jump in before we start with our first topic. Hi, Casey. Uh, it's uh, Greg Ambrosic here with Indigenous Services Canada. It's good to see you again. Unfortunately, I can't get my camera working. But um, I'm uh, now a program advisor with Indigenous Services Canada working in the central region. And I work, live, and play in the traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Sabletooth. And uh, just looking forward to um, a good meeting and uh, just having having connections with people so we can have, uh, hopefully, an uneventful summer. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Uh, anyone else want to briefly introduce themselves, if you haven't yet? It looks like we've uh, we've introduced everyone. We we have about sixty five people in the 
in the uh, the meeting, which is great. A lot of interest, and hopefully we're going to have a continuation of great discussion and sharing. It's my pleasure to introduce Juan Serino, who will be presenting on the 2018 Shovel Lake wildfire as our first um, presentation. Uh, Juan, did you want to try to screen share? Yeah, uh, before I do that, I'll, I'll uh, say a few words and um, I would like to ask uh, Serena Green from uh, my community to say a few words about uh, who is Natalie Within people. Uh, she's uh, the best person to do that. Um, immediately after that, um, I would like to move into providing an overview of um, the our experiences uh, with the wildfires up to date. Um, I'll be talking about the, the Chavo Lake wildfire that um, pretty much decimated that 20% of the, the traditional lands in the territory. Um, I'm gonna be addressing the issues regarding struggles, growing pains, and collaboration with emergency management. And now I'll end up my presentation with uh, talking about uh, the need for um, what was known in uh, the Chapman Naval Report as uh, the Regional Centers of Excellence in Emergency Management. So that's, uh, that's the plan. I hope not to take uh, too much time because um, in between and at the end of the presentation, I will like uh, people asking questions, making comments, uh, and hopefully entering into a wholesome uh, discussion because it's, uh, it's a very important subject matter. Um, it is uh, February and uh, the fire season is starting. So it's, it's uh, something to be concerned. So I'll leave, uh, at uh, the, the screen to Serena to introduce our community, and then I'll, I'll pick it up. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. <clears throat> Once again, Bandara Hunzu, means good morning in my, in my language. Uh, we are from the Notley Within First Nations not live within means where the salmon return. We are a very strong community. And Juan's doing a really awesome job of protecting our people with his job and our First Nations as firefighters. Um, in Notley, we believe in respect and positive outcomes. We believe in working together. In Notley, we, um, we take care of our children and we work together. If you see our logo, it's a circle of people holding hands and working together. So I'm very proud to that Juan is working with us. And I myself personally, I, I adopted him as my uncle. So he's my uncle Juan. I'm proud to say that out loud. Um, Snell Chalia for doing the hard work and dedication that you do for our community and uh, keeping us safe. Snell Chalia. And Thank have, you. have a good day. Thank you very much for those words. Thank you, Serena, and uh, you're wel welcome to stay for the rest of um, the meeting. Thank you very much for your beautiful words. Um, can people hear me? We can hear you. Um, I'll be sharing um, a few pictures, and I'll be speaking about each of the pictures briefly. Um, long time ago, I heard that uh, a picture is worth a thousand a thousand words. So I'll be sharing with you about uh, well over 30,000 words today. Thank you. Um, I'm sharing the screen now. Uh, can people see that? Yep, we can see it just fine. Thank you. 
perfect. Um, Natalie, within um, the, the experiences of uh, the community, to my understanding, with uh, wildfire was um, was not that, that extensive. Um, before 2018, uh, there was uh, wildfires uh, the, the year prior. We, we did have uh, a few firefighters in the community, but uh, nothing as compared to other communities uh, where fires uh, had been raged for for many decades already, and uh, they were much better prepared than uh, Natalie Wettin. So it was uh, one one day during uh, late July, as I understand, <clears throat> that um, a fire broke out in the um, in the territory, and uh, the picture you are seeing is showing. Uh, a uh, former chief uh, Larry Nuski with a camera, and the back, uh, the person showing the back is uh, Mr. Noel Ketlo, uh, who is very, very knowledgeable of, uh, about the lands. And uh, these two people that uh, were concerned, they went out and trying to assess uh, what was happening. Communication was terrible. Um, uh, the nation was not communicated properly. Um, the same sentiment was expressed during the fire and after the fire by uh, the regional district of uh, Bulkley, Nechaco. So there was a miscommunication uh, regarding um, uh, this, uh, this event. So I was called that to the community on um, uh, August, um, I arrived, I believe, somewhere about August 11 into the community, August 11 of 2018. By August 13, um, we were responding. Uh, in a couple of days, uh, we set up a team and um, we we started responding to to the wildfire. And as everybody knows, uh, it wasn't a small fire. Uh, like I said before, the Chavon Lake wildfire and the Island Lake wildfire combined uh, born 120,000 hectares of land. That amounts to more than 20% of the traditional territory. So one of the interesting things, and I'm glad that uh, Ed is uh, with us from in here from Estelatin, one of the, the very interesting things that happened at the time is that we organized two communities to respond to this fire, Estelatin First Nation and Natalie Within First Nation. So another picture of uh, the fire, um, it, like I said before, it wasn't uh, a small fire, it was uh, quite dramatic. Um, the few firefighters uh, we had uh, trained in the community, of course, uh, joined the, the the firefighting efforts immediately. Uh, here is a picture of Noel on the background and uh, another community member uh, on the foreground uh, working, uh, working the fire. Uh, this picture here shows um, our friends from Mexico. Uh, as you probably recall, uh, during 2017 and 2018, and uh, several years after that, uh, we had contingent of uh, firefighters from Mexico. I speak uh, fluent Spanish, actually, I'm from Chile, I'm from Latin America, so it was nice to see them uh, and uh, work alongside them. This picture here was taken at one o'clock or one thirty in the afternoon. Um, it was uh, supposed to be a very bright and sunny day, but uh, what you can see here is um, uh, the automatic lights on uh, the building, which is a beautiful building, by the way, uh, already being light up. It was darkness at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. During the fire, we experienced uh, the loss of um, a couple of structures very dear to the heart of the community. Uh, this picture was taken 
at the Ormond Lake um, uh, Cultural Camp and Healing Camp. Uh, we lost um, two cabins in there and uh, um, a smoke house. After working with the uh, Indigenous Services Canada for a long period of time, uh, we were finally able to to rebuild those uh, those structures. Uh, thank you, to Indigenous Services Canada. However, as I'm going to be speaking later on, there are still many unanswered recovery issues in our community, including the fact that, that we still carry a deficit of three hundred and five thousand dollars from the 2018 wildfire. Uh, that's another picture of um, Ormond Lake. Um, that's uh, the site of uh, the other cabin that uh, was born. Uh, another picture of uh, the wildfire. This fire though was something that um, we planned and implemented. Um, I think that uh, at the time uh, we were looking at how close uh, the fires were in our community, to our community, and we do have a trail, a heritage trail, that uh, divide the wildlands from um, our subdivisions, our home subdivisions. So we made the decision to put a number of trees down and uh, to burn them. Uh, we did a backbone right there. Uh, that was our decision, and we did it on our own. Suffice so to say that after a backbone, uh, we left a mess in there. A mess that uh, we had to clean and um, and and to uh, to recover. So we called upon the uh, wildfire services BC, and I remember my good friend. Uh, my preacher said that, uh, well, we didn't call for that back burning. Uh, you did. So the, the, the situation was here that um, um, Wildfire Service BC could not cover the, cover, the cost of um, uh, rehabilitating the, the trail. And my answer was that uh, I thought that we were partners in all this, so... I figured that if I made a boo-boo, uh, you will have my back. And at the end, uh, we did enter into an agreement. We we rehabilitated the, the lands, and uh, it looks beautiful now. During a wildfire, uh, there is occasions where um, we have time to rejoice and uh, get all together. And um, often politicians do come into the picture, and I think that we have one in the center there. Um, I work in a community where one of the most important things that um, people do is to celebrate. Um, it's, a, it's a community that is very joyful. Um, uh, is very grateful to one another, very caring uh, among each other. And um, this picture that shows um, our own firefighters, uh, firefighters from the province of BC, and um, the yellow uh, shirts are from our Mexican uh, friends. And um, I believe I'm wearing a cowboy had had that somewhere in there. So during the wildfire, we had to evacuate our community members. And um, when uh, they came back, uh, we welcomed them back. And uh, this is um, the way in which uh, we celebrate uh, when they were back.
So that's uh, how we responded and organized uh, to to the 2018 wildfire. Then there is uh, the need to organize uh, for recovery. So we started working on recovery, developed a few mangoes uh, plans, uh, recovery plans, and um, we identified the issues that, that we needed to work with um, or to address. Our primary concern was, um, of course, um, addressing the needs of our community members. People was our primary concern. Then um, we look at uh, the economy, the environment, the reconstruction of uh, structures. And now we start thinking about mitigating and preparing for the future. At that time, we knew with certainty that we could not allow something similar to happen in our community. We were not that prepared to lose another 20% of uh, the traditional territory to wildfires. So we have done our very best uh, to, to prepare, to plan, uh, to acquire training. Uh, Venice have been uh, amazing in terms of uh, working with us uh, to train our firefighters to the point that today we have the first indigenous initial attack crew, I believe, um, in the north of uh, the province, and I believe it's probably the second one in the province. Um, so we have grown a lot, and uh, our our uh, initial attack fire crew is not only unique, uh, but it's also led by a woman, uh, which make uh, all of us uh, extremely proud. Uh, today, uh, the site that where we lost uh, the two cabins and uh, the smokehouse um, has been um, uh, rebuilt by nature. Uh, nature has an amazing capacity to to look after the disasters. Um, I have learned in, in this journey that uh, after a wildfire, depending on the intensity, of course, uh, we may see new plants, new medicine that we may not have been seen for a hundred years. So it's not all bad news. Uh, we don't have to worry about, oh, we lost uh, uh, 100 hectares of uh, timberlands and let's go and replant that right away. No, I think that the people need to think that the nature is infinitely more uh, wiser than uh, than human beings. Um, of course, uh, some areas uh, will need to be replanted, uh, but uh, I will argue that uh, not in the way that it's been done now. Planting one single species of trees, sprinkle them with glyphosate, and um, create even more hazards in, in our communities. During the wildfire, we lost uh, salmon, and salmon is very important for all of us in BC. Um, so we have to work with the neighboring communities, and uh, they were very generous, and uh, they, we were allowed to put a few mm -hmm. salmon back in into the small houses. Um, in the process of uh, trying to figure out a path forward, uh, uh, we attended uh, numerous uh, meetings and gatherings. Uh, I'm glad that uh, my good friend uh, Jeremiah Lewis is here because uh, um, after the wildfire, uh, we were uh, both uh, members of uh, the Tripartite Committee on uh, Emergency Management and uh, we put forward our uh, views and um, an interest in regards of uh, the development of the new Emergency and Disaster Management Act. So we did uh, work at that level as well. Uh, this here is a picture of uh, former Chief uh, Larry Nuski addressing the Union of PC Municipalities. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, he put forward a very beautiful presentation, uh, very well prepared. Uh, develop um, uh, 
a very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, the next day, the newspapers in Prince George uh, had a tremendous article about uh, someone else from a neighboring municipality. And his name was uh, briefly named in uh, one sentence or less. Uh, that goes to say that uh, uh, our opinions um, didn't really matter much at the time. Um, this is a picture of um, our efforts in uh, fuel management. We figured that we need to protect our community. We need to do our very best uh, to to do as much as possible to prevent the fire from encroaching our community. And uh, we entered into a couple of um, uh, CRI uh, projects um, with um, the Union of PC Municipalities at the time when uh, fuel management projects were very new. They were so new that uh, uh, foresters, um, or at least the foresters that we contacted, didn't have a clue as to how to develop prescription, what was expected. Um, in retrospect, uh, I've been thinking that um, foresters are trained to do something very specific. Um, my, my understanding that a forester is trained to take a look at the landscape, uh, looking at the tree species, uh, age of the trees, diameters, and all those things, and estimate how much money is there. Um, that's what they, I believe they're trained to do. They're not trained to prevent wildfires. So we experienced a number of um, uh, difficulties during this process. Uh, working with the UBCM uh, wasn't a walk in the park. Um, I, I have told them directly that uh, uh, some of the staff members in the organization were very rude. Um, uh, we experienced racial discrimination. We, we experienced a lack of respect. And uh, it was a bad working relationship uh, from the very beginning. So... We were, we were told that uh, in order for us to do this work, we had to follow, cert, follow certain guidelines, uh, financial guidelines. In other words, uh, we were told that uh, there was an X amount of money allocated for each of uh, the hectares of land that uh, we were treating. Um, well, we figured they probably know better than we do. We estimated that the cost of doing the work significantly higher, just knowing uh, what the workers can produce on a, on, on a day of labor um, in the difficult terrain and the extensive forest that, that we have in our community. But uh, it appears that uh, People managing the program in uh, UPCM felt that uh, they knew better. So we entered into a couple of contracts um, that were financially very damaging to us. The end result is that, that we are closing those projects now. And now we have a $250,000 deficit in those uh, projects. Uh, that's another picture of our fuel management uh, team. Um, this, I believe, is um, a recovery structure that we develop, uh, and uh, this is uh, moving forward to uh, 2023, and uh, it's a picture of um, four of our initial attack crew members. On uh, the right side of the screen is... Um, uh, Chris Inuski, and uh, she's uh, the crew leader for the initial attack crew. Uh, very joyful people, hard workers, uh, and uh, a group of young people that made us make us uh, very, very proud. Uh, this other picture is uh, some of our firefighters um, joining uh, our local firefighting uh, team. 
Uh, we made it, um, and I'm reading policy in our community that uh, if anybody wants uh, the glory of being a wildland uh, firefighter, they also need to commit to protect uh, the community and become a volunteer firefighter. So that's uh, the group of uh, uh, firefighters in our community now doing some uh, preventative work in the community. So that's the more formal presentation. And uh, I have um, another, uh, another uh, video to show to, to all of you. But at this time, I would like to pause and um, um, encourage people to ask questions and uh, enter into what I refer to as a wholesome conversation, uh, because we are already at the point where in the north, the uh, fires are already popping up. Uh, we don't have to wait till the July or August anymore. Um, I attended a meeting with the uh, Banjama fires on um, uh, last Monday, I believe it was. And um, we were told that uh, the fires are, are are already popping up in in the in the area. So with that, I would like to ask people to ask for clarifications. If anybody didn't understood what I was saying, I can translate it into Italian, French, and La Capuchin, uh, Spanish, or um, a couple more uh, languages. I'm still working on that Akel, though. Uh, I know this. I know this. Uh, uh, Sidina is uh, is laughing in there, so uh, I'm working on it. Honestly, thank you. So I'll pause in here. Uh, questions, comments uh, are welcome at this time. So people can either please raise their hands or um, <clears throat> or just jump in if you're on the phone. If there's any questions, I know that's a lot of information. And uh, I see in the chat, um, how many days from the day of ignition did it take for the fire to be deemed under control? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that um, uh, we declare a state of a uh, local emergency two days before the province declared a state of local emergency. Um, and we also finished the state of local emergency uh, seven hours before the province uh, called it off. So the, in, in essence, um, the fire that born for it intensively, uh, they were still smoldering after that uh, in all over the territory, but intensively, I think uh, we were looking at about 14 days at least. Thank you for that. I see a hand raised, uh, Natasha Colbreth. Uh, hello, Juan, and thank you for your presentation. I just have a quick question about um, e like your emergency plan, I guess your evacuation plan for your community. Um, right now, I'm just trying to come up with something for my community. Um, we do have like an emergency evacuation plan, but um, as many of you probably have something similar, it's quite, quite a big um, document. So right now, I'm just trying to work on making a more condensed, smaller document that I can present to our community before the fire season. So my question is, do you have one? Um, how did you, did you, were you able to educate your community before having to evacuate? And if you have any um, tips on what I can add to this or include, um, and also if I can, if I can get your contact information and maybe have a chat with you in the upcoming days when you have a chance. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for the question. Uh, and that's a very important uh, and interesting question. The answer to that is that uh, when we 
when we organized in Italy, remember that we had a, a couple of days to organize ourselves. Uh, the fire was already in our doorsteps. So no, we didn't have a, an evacuation route plan as it is known right now. We have not one now, but uh, at the time we didn't have one. We did have to evacuate our community members and we did so by relying on the, the local knowledge about who were the most vulnerable people, who didn't have access to transportation, uh, um, what uh, what family or individual needed the uh, transportation and assistance. So when the decision was made that to evacuate the community, we evacuated the entire community. Um, we already knew by working with our health department who do we needed to assist to move out of the community. So that's how the evacuation was um, was conducted by by working as a team and uh, relying on everybody's knowledge and uh, having everybody participating on on the evacuation. Now today we do have an evacuation route plan, uh, and uh, I'll be more than uh, happy to share that plan with you. I can send you what we have done, uh, and I will advise that. Uh, in order for you to make a meaningful the plan, all you need to do is to look at your landscape. What are your entries? What are your exits? What kind of uh, difficulties, difficulties that you may encounter when exiting one area or the other area? And you need to make take in consideration the amount of uh, timber if uh, you are evacuating from a wildfire and uh, the potential dangers of using the that as an evacuation route. The most important thing is uh, to talk to your community and to plan together. And uh, the planning doesn't need to be um, uh, doesn't need to be done in in haste. Uh, doesn't need to to make people nervous. Uh, make it fun. Uh, bring people together and start talking about it and start relying on the wisdom of your community. They know better. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Jackie Wilson, I see your hand raised. Hi, Jackie. Yes, thank Hello, Juan. Thank you so much for the presentation and for offering to uh, share your evacuation plan with Natasha, and this is actually for Natasha. Natasha, I can reach out with you to you as well, as we have templates and such that can help you with your evacuation plan. So uh, I will follow up with you uh, this afternoon if you're available or, or whenever we can arrange it. And uh, But Juan, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, those uh, images brought back a lot of memories as I was uh, there with BC Wildfire supporting the, the response. and. Um, when it turned to tonight at one o'clock in the afternoon, um, that was an experience I'd never had before and um, was very nerve wracking. So um, yeah, I, I, I remember that well, sometimes I don't want to, but thank you Juan very much for sharing. Thank you, Jackie. I would like to make a comment. Um... Um, I believe I'm well known for being very critical of uh, government agencies. Um, I don't mean word when I criticize uh, operational policies, but that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have a huge respect for everybody that works in those organizations. Uh, the individuals that work in those organizations, like Jackie, they're wonderful, beautiful individuals. The policies that direct the work and direct the manner in which they work, uh, those are the ones that, that we have an issue with. And we will continue to advocate for changes. One of the most important changes for us today is to make it clear to all government departments that the First Nation across BC have the right and privilege to be part of decision making <clears throat> that affects their community members and their lands. <clears throat> what does it mean? It means that uh, during a wildfire, for example, or, or a critical event of any nature, 
there is an, in, an incident command center that makes decisions and, and prioritize. We must be part of those decisions. And we must be part of those decisions because we have to advise people as to our values. The purpose of responding to an emergency is um is to is to protect values, human lives, uh, critical the infrastructure and the like. We have our own values which may not be clearly being seen by other people. Namely, we have uh, human remains in different uh, old villages on the territory. We have uh, archaeological artifacts that need to be, be protected. We have critical watersheds that we don't want anybody to damage any further. So when somebody is planning on carrying a, a fire guard, we have to be part of those decisions. And I'm very, very upset because this year um, we propose such to work in the way that, that we worked during the 2018 wildfire. During the 2018 wildfire season, a representative from Estelaten First Nation and myself uh, were at the, the planning meetings of uh, the Incident Command Center here in Fraser Lake. Every morning, the Incident Command Center from the province came to our morning meetings, our morning planning meetings. So there was a cross-pollination of information and, uh, and planning was done um, quite expediently and it worked extremely well. Last year, during the, the last year wildfire season, we sent a letter to wildfire services um, expressing our interest on in, uh, doing exactly the same this year. We were never, ever replied to. Uh, we, we raised uh, the concern at different tables and uh, it just didn't happen. So my question is, what's happening? Why some, some government departments are thinking that uh, protecting people and protecting the land, which is owned by the way by First Nation communities, is their sole domain. No, it is not. And that has to change. We have a new piece of legislation. Let's focus, focus now on, um, <clears throat> on, on the, the administrative uh, decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Um, are there any um, last minute questions before we uh, conclude this um, and move on to the next topic? The raise of hands and, and Juan, is there any, any last thing before uh, you conclude? Um, I have um, a video that um, uh, people, we can show for a couple minutes, it's four minutes, but I don't want to abuse anybody's time. People can watch it, it's on YouTube, but um, the video shows uh, our firefighters um, uh, fighting a fire, and uh, I think that the, the music and seeing all the young people that are being so courageous and doing what uh, they do best, which is protect our people and lands, uh, almost brought tears uh, to my eyes. Uh, so please allow me to change it at least a minute of the video and then we can cut it off and we can go on. All right. If you can make that attempt, that would be great. Yep. yep. Uh, your presentation's up, but not the video. Oh. Uh, I can see. Oh, I, I have to share my screen. And I can try if you'd like, unless you have it. Can you see it? We can see it. It's a perfect day in a time Like to run out of time Life has to bring surrender And there's nothing left for us to do But it's strange to see the truth I'm 
Nice one. We can we can see the the sound is a little garbled though. I put the uh, YouTube link in the chat for people if they want to view it directly on YouTube as well. Thank you very much. Uh, you also put a note about uh, the title of uh, the video. Please watch it. It's, um, it's a beautiful piece of work done by a firefighter, not by a professional videographer. Once again, uh, have a great day. So thank you, Juan, and thank you, Serena, for a wonderful presentation and for all the uh, questions and the good sharing. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie Svensson, who will talk uh, briefly about wildfire preparedness and response. Thanks, Casey. Uh, audio visual check, everything good? We're good. Uh, could you monitor the chat for me too, please, Casey? That'd be great. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, yeah, just a little recap on the two, 2023 season. Uh, finesse response support teams were definitely tested this past season, but I'm proud to say that uh, we received uh, over 43 nations who reached out on a variety of needs. Uh, we're all supported. Um, we overcame many challenges. It was our first big year. Our crews protected over 1,500 homes and had about 246 direct saves. So pretty proud of the work the crews did out there. Uh, crews with the support from MISC uh, provided structure protection and mitigation work to hundreds of structures being threatened by wildfire. Uh, these included homes, community halls, heritage buildings, cultural and sacred sites, uh, to name a few. Um, I really want to take this opportunity to recognize and thank all the community members, many of whom are on this call, who worked hand in hand alongside with Finesse in their efforts to protect their communities. So yeah, just a big shout out to to everyone who who helped support us uh, during a pretty challenging year last year. Just a quick finesse trailer update. Uh, we currently have six Tiger Dam trailers, six fuel mitigation trailers, and we have currently have seven Type Two structure protection units. Uh, for those that are familiar with structure protection units, we have the the equipment to to protect structures, sprinklers, pumps, uh, portable tanks and all the hose and fittings uh, to set up on uh, between 15 and 30 structures, depending on the size of the community. One of those SBUs is also used for our training trailer. Uh, these trailers are stored in Kamloops and will be staged around the province as required. Uh, we are currently looking at staging uh, two type two structure protection units and one Tiger Dam trailer in the Prince George area so we can better serve our Northern uh, communities um, if required. Our structure protection training uh, has really taken off. Um, we are supported by our Rider Ventures crew uh, who continue to deliver structure protection training throughout our province. Um, our trainers have years of experience and understand the values associated with our First Nations communities. Last year's pre-wildfire season training provided community members with the skills, knowledge and abilities to start structure protection operations safely until support arrived, uh, which is really critical in a lot of communities. Uh, we continue and will continue to support the training needs of our First Nations. And we're really looking at building uh, those teams across the province, which I'll touch on in a second here. Um, structure protection equipment, um, evaluation and support. This is one thing that 
um, community has reached out uh, to finesse um, to support when purchasing equipment. So communities are looking at purchasing their own equipment. Um, we're happy to be involved if you need support with that. We come in and do a needs assessment uh, in for the area. And that ensures that you receive the proper equipment based on the community needs. Uh, once the equipment has been received, uh, finesse members um, can come out and visit your community to provide the training uh, as required. So please keep that in mind if you if the community is looking for not only just equipment, pumps and hoses, uh, sprinklers, but also uh, structure protection trailers. Um, there's been several communities that are starting to build structure protection trailers um, and uh, we're happy to support that and work with uh, work with communities on designing those trailers uh, for the specific needs. So please reach out. I'll put all the information in the chat at the end of the presentation. Our wildfire mitigation support trailers, uh, they were deployed pretty much the whole season last year. Uh, we supported many communities led by our team leaders uh, and also supported by community members. We're hired to work with finesse. Um, we pay community members that that funding goes right back into the community. Um, they do amusing, amazing work uh, hand in hand with us to protect the communities. Um, we, we understand the importance and so do the community members of culturally sensitive sites and using the, uh, the lo local knowledge keepers who really can provide the valuable information and locations uh, for our crews to get in there and, and do support uh, through mitigation work. Um, the crews went above and beyond last year, uh, several times they were going kilometers into the forest uh, to, you know, to do mitigation work around um, heritage cabins and, and trapping cabins. So really proud of a lot of the work um, that our crews did last year with our mitigation trailers. The Tiger Dam trailers, um, we continue to enhance our Tiger Dam trailers. Uh, each trailer has uh, about 33,000 feet of Tiger Dams and a variety of anchoring systems. And these trailers can be positioned around the province um, if there's atmospheric rivers or potential flooding sites um, and, and weather forecasts that are up and coming, you can reach out, uh, give us a call uh, if you have concerns and we can look at uh, pre-positioning Tiger Dam trailers into communities and also uh, work with community members uh, to train them on how to use our equipment. Um, so that's, uh, that's a big part of uh, our trailer deployments. Um, this year, we started our community training initiative. So we're reaching out and providing trainees to communities. Um, it's really well been well received around the province. Communities and community members who are interested in taking structure protection, mitigation, or even our Tiger Dam training are encouraged to reach out to Finesse uh, for more information and available dates that we can set up in your community. This training is no cost to the community. Um, we are also working on increasing our capacity for those who would like to support finesse at a local level who might be able to respond provincially and help out other nations. So really important to build the, build the crews. And then Juan, Juan's presentation, you know, they've got a very active crew in their community. Um, we would like to, to share that resource if it's possible to other communities who might be in need. So those who are interested are trained and will be added to our response support list. So please, I encourage you, whether it's one person in a community or a team of members uh, who require the training and who are interested, I'm happy to, to um, provide that information to you. So please um, feel free to reach out. Our structure defense planning is something we started last year. So when we were asked to come into community to do structure uh, protection training, uh, we also can spend the extra day and develop structure defense plans for the community. Um, these plans provide valuable information to the community and to the incoming resources. This information on uh, provided is, uh, you know, covers like water sources, critical infrastructure, sensitive sites, heritage buildings, and, and all the equipment that's required. We put it together uh, working with our decision, decision support team and uh, mapping, and we come up with a, uh, with a structure defense plan that can be utilized by the community um, for anything that could be coming in. Uh, the plan is put together by Finesse and uh, reviewed annually just to make sure that current information is on there. Um, how does your community request support from Finesse? So we have our after hours assistance line, which is answered 24 7, 365. 
and I will put it in the chat, but the, the number is 1-888-822-3388. Again, that's 1-888-822-3388. That line is uh, answered 24 seven, as I said, and um, it's, it's, for, it's there for, for community members who have concerns, uh, who need just some information. Uh, please call that line and it'll be directed to the proper manager to, to suit the inquiry. Uh, we have a dedicated decision support team member, and I know Brendan's going to probably touch on it, um, that can gener generate a variety of information for communities throughout the wildfire season. Um, this person was very active last year. We were sending out plant maps and, and a lot of different information that was um, being sourced by communities. Uh, so please reach out uh, for information. Again, you can call that 1-800 line uh, for information on mapping and, and a variety of information to support. Last year, we had a finesse had a staff member located in the Structure Protection Coordination Office in Kamloops. Um, this position really provides a vital link between BC Wildfire Service and our our First Nations communities, that person is in there during um, the wildfire season and is working with the Structure Protection Coordination, Coordination Office members on uh, getting information on the needs of the communities and uh, updated fire information. Uh, so it's a really important position uh, for us and uh, that information gets passed on to our emergency support center. Um, if you have any questions, again, I'll put this in the chat. Um, happy to answer them. And uh, any follow-up uh, structure defense planning or training needs, uh, please contact myself at 778-694-9211. Again, it's Jamie at 778-694-9211, and I will post it in the chat. I think that's it, Casey. I know that was a lot to go over in a short period of time, but um, yeah, yeah. We have one question in the chat. Um, just wondering how Finesse tracks what communities have, what resources in terms of available equipment and workforce. Yeah, great question. At this point, uh, now that you've discussed that, we're we're definitely going to be looking at um, tracking communities that do have equipment. Uh, this is fairly new to a lot of communities after last year's wildfire season, but that's a great point. And uh, we will definitely uh, look at uh, doing some um, some inventory uh, management uh, with communities. Thanks. And before we move on to the two hands, um, just for everyone's knowledge, uh, we can go an extra 15 minutes over if we need to on this. We'll try to keep our presentation super short. Um, I see two hands raised. Owen Bloor. Hey, Jamie. Uh, Hi, Owen. How are you? Good, my friend. How are you? Good, good. Just curious if Finesse has, has uh, started discussions on potential of a, of a more regionalized setting and, and office setting, uh, including equipment, um, like we had discussed last year. You know, yeah. having something closer than Kamloops would be super awesome for us up in the north because we've got a lot of holdover fires this year. Yes. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just just curious if you guys are. Yeah, that's a great question, Owen. Um, we're definitely still pursuing um, looking at offices located uh, around the province and, and regionalizing uh, some of the areas. At this point, we've identified uh, some areas to stage trailers. Uh, as I mentioned, we are definitely going to be putting some uh, structure protection and mitigation trailers up towards uh, your area um, that will be easily accessible uh, by finesse staff or local uh, community members um, that have uh, that are supporting us. So we will be moving trailers up there uh, fairly quickly, actually, um, after seeing some of the the news of the north. So, but uh, yeah, we're still pursuing the the regionalization of. Uh, of, of finesse and better better supporting uh, our regions. So thank you for that. Oh, cool. yeah, and, and we're we're working on on a on a defense system, not necessarily a SPU, but um, we're just in the infancy of of it'll be a CCAM that's that's loadable mm -hmm. and um, provides some significant uh, volume of water per minute. 
Awesome. Yeah. Just reach out if you, if you need any support on that, Owen. I will for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Great. Thank you. We have two, uh, two more questions before we get on. Um, Juan, if you have a quick question. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, more than a question is, uh, is a follow-up comment. Um, I think that uh, what we need to focus on is on developing human capacity on First Nation communities. Uh, uh, throughout uh, the province, there are many First Nation community members uh, who have uh, fought firefighters when uh, there was a big crisis, but they don't have uh, what is known as a standing the service agreement with the province. It's not easy, uh, at least for me, to, to navigate through a busy beats and uh, put our firefighters on, on a rooster. I think that uh, if the NACE can help us all to navigate those things, uh, that would be great. You have people like um, uh, Dale, um, uh, Dale, uh, what's his, his last name? Uh, it is keep my mind right now, but uh, he's very knowledgeable uh, about uh, these contracts and how to, to apply for these contracts. My other comment has to do with uh, the regionalization that you're speaking about. I think that I will go a bit further and trying to regain the notion of um, regional centers of excellence in emergency management, where we can all work together and we can all be active participants in the, the planning, response, mitigation, and preparedness on, the, on emergencies. I think that uh, when uh, we start discussing uh, the need for these centers, the response uh, from governments, both levels of government was uh, uh, very supportive, uh, but the legislation did not allow for those uh, movements. Now the legislation allow for it. Uh, let's sit down and uh, work towards that. Mm -hmm. Can I yeah, great, great points. I, I want to comment. I, I, I uh, agree with you 100% on community capacity. Uh, we've got a lot of talent out there, a lot of knowledge that we want to capitalize on and create these teams that can not only respond locally, but can respond to help around the province. And Finesse has the resources and are building the resources. We just can't be the response uh, organization. We need to be supported. So we, if we can build those teams and we have teams like you have, within community that are willing to travel we can come to community teach these crews uh in the 115 program and work with them on building good team leaders that could finesse could tow a trailer to your community and your community could utilize the equipment if they're trained to do so and we can be there to support or not depending on the level the capacity of the training and the level of experience so that's one thing that we're we're, we're really working on is to be able to create those in-house community members and teams that we can call on. As far as the BC Wildfire Service programs and the their requirements, um, there is needs and contract agreements um, that they utilize. Um, we don't fall under that, so we can we can come in and and of course as long as they're trained and safe to do so, and that we have the guidance there and the team leader that is. Uh, that is well experienced, then we can work with the local communities on protecting their own areas. So we're very, working extremely hard on, on building that capacity around the province. Thank you, Jamie. Um, before we move on to the one question, um, I just wanna to quickly touch base with uh, Brendan, Carrie, Ann, and EMCR and ISC. Are you all okay going an extra 15 minutes if we need to? Or does anyone need to leave precisely at noon on our uh, presenters. I just wanted yeah. to quickly check. Yeah, this okay. is Peter from yeah. EMCR. I'm fine. That's great. Okay. Uh, Carrie Ann, are you good as well? Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, if we can keep our questions and uh, responses as brief as we can, we'll, uh, we'll try to finish by noon. And if not, we'll go over <laughs> another 15. Um, Paul McCarthy, you have the honor of the last question. The honor of the last question. Well, <laughs> I better make it good. Uh, long time no see, Jamie. It's good to see you. Just, just a question. Um, 
It's more of a, an EMCR related question when it comes to community supports. My time in local government, it was really hard to get EMCR to make community resources available for responses. So you'd have to, they'd pay for contractors, but they wouldn't pay for community resources. Like if WLFN had a backhoe, we couldn't be reimbursed for using our own backhoe. Is that changing or is that still an eligibility um, quagmire? Yeah. So, yeah, this is this is a deep question. So there's so last season there was quite a few instances where um, the response didn't fall within the EMCR BC Wildfire Services protocols. So finesse looks at that with support by ISC um, and our decision support team. We look at what's required, and um, we do contract out and hire uh, certain uh, resources to come in. Uh, based on the community needs. And uh, we work with ISC on payment uh, for those resources to come in. Uh, so water tenders, uh, equipment that the, the First Nations have uh, and, and other types of resources, um, uh, track equipment and stuff. We can look at sourcing that and paying for that, um, that resource to come in and support us. So there is, uh, there is other avenues that we utilize uh, to get the uh, get into the community what's needed to protect it. Um, so yeah, there is, and we can, I can sidebar on you a bit more with that, Paul, and, and kind of bring you up to date on that. Thank you, Jamie. If I can uh, quickly, Casey, maybe add, uh, Finesse is adding a bunch of regional climate coordinators this year to be specifically in each region and just help out with funding related to climate resiliency and disaster risk reduction. And so if you want something that's typically not in the grant programs that we're used to, uh, the climate coordinators will be able to help find other funding from other sources potentially to make those things happen. Um, currently, we have Christopher Peters and Mandy Yantha as the coordinators, but we'll be adding more here in the next month or so uh, to start covering all the regions more specifically. So don't hesitate to reach out in the interim. On that note, Brendan, have you guys found anybody to be the coordinator for the Northeast region yet? Uh, yes, actually, we just hired a, a lovely First Nations woman um, <clears throat> that has a background in forestry and has helped communities with community forests and all kinds of uh, great work in the past. Uh, but she'll be okay. starting at near the beginning of March. <clears throat> okay. Thank um, you very much. Make sure she uh, circulates her contact info. Oh, absolutely. I'll get her to connect with everybody as soon as she uh, gets started. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Brendan, you're number four. Take it away for a brief presentation, and uh, uh, I'll let you start. Okay, thanks, Casey. Um, all right, as many of you know, we uh, used the Lightship tool to basically help get all the best data and information collected in one place and two communities in a in the most convenient way possible. So that just involves pulling stuff from the federal government, NASA, all kinds of places, ortho imagery, LIDAR, and then giving it to communities through primarily through the light chip tool, but there's other ways to pass along data and information. Um, and so again, the whole idea is get it, the best information we possibly can, put it together, streamline it so that it can help communities with emergency management, but data and information uh, can be used for all kinds of other governance, environmental objectives, uh, many of things. So with this presentation in particular, um, I was, I'm was i also doing a student at the same time, so it be, kind of became a cool intersection of a project I'm working on for school and a presentation around wildfire risk. So I hope to show you a bunch of the sort of advanced fire behavior prediction tools that are out there and how that can help with real-time mapping and understanding some of the risks to communities. In order to do that, I'm actually going to play a game that I programmed earlier. So just starting off, we're going to look at talking to Elder Ray, and he just gives us a little bit more information about the Sendai priorities, understanding risk, strengthening governance, investing in disaster risk reduction, and then preparing for emergencies. I won't talk to everybody, but uh, we got Bill Nye here. We'll give us a little bit more information on actually reducing the risk. But Bill Nye basically tells us to run down the path here and start talking to Elder Annie, who will give us more information up what we got to do clean up sticks and leaves the things that we have to do to reduce risk in and around communities um, and then she says go to the lookout tower next so you can get a better idea of what risk looks like in and around some communities so what i'm going to do is here is quickly run up to the 
uh, tower here, and then I'm going to run into the fire chief at the top, and then I'm going to be able to acquire a risk assessment. And it'll be one of the many different assessment tools that Finesse has on the Lightship platform available. We have things like fire smart home ignition zones, uh, normal wildfire threat assessments. But basically, once I start talking to Wayne here about the different types of risk assessments, I'm able to click on this and link into the light, uh, Finesse Lightship platform and then actually fill out a risk assessment. In this case, this is a pretty basic one I put together for a Minecraft one. But you can uh, pick, again, different risk areas and sort of score those high, moderate, whatever you need to better understand risk at a community level. We put all the forms together to capture risk information, capture um, information related to evacuation plans. And then all of these uh, information pieces show up on the map afterwards so that we can get a better idea of uh, where some of these risks are. In order to understand um, how some of this works in relation to some of the big data sets that we pull in, I'm opening up a weather calculation tool here. And once it loads up, we can choose any weather station in the province and then get a printout of what the conditions might be like. Um, so in this case, I know we're in the virtual Minecraft world, so maybe I'll just uh, pick this Alexis Creek one. We'll look at the last 10 years and the 90th percentile weather conditions. So this model here tells us what the fine fuel moisture codes, the buildup indexes, the spread rates are going to be uh, for this particular weather station. So decision support takes all those data from all these places and then tries to integrate it into that Lightship platform. And I'll show you more about the platform here in a minute. But this is just one of the many ways that uh, we're sort of combing and finding information to help with uh, risk-based planning. Next, I'm going to go into a newer tool that was actually developed by BC Wildfire Service. So credit to them. This is actually a pretty helpful one. You can do some, um, I guess, light fire behavior modeling. Once this loads up, we'll give you a quick uh, introduction to it. But basically, there's all these variables that you can input. It, it, the sliders, so you can change your wind speed, change your wind direction, depending on the actual conditions of the community level. You can change your fine fuel moisture codes, your buildup indexes. But the key is, is what I'll start off here with is um, adding a, uh, say we'll pick a spruce type as an example, and we're gonna run this model for 120 minutes. And then we can adjust all these dials on the screen here, aspect, buildup indexes. And as I scale this one, you'll notice some of those color bars change. Well, that's because these outputs will tell you what the fire is likely to do based on the inputs that are coming into the system. So if we are looking on Lightship and saying, okay, the buildup index in this case is 70, the FMC is 85, wind speed 17, this is what we could expect to see. And as Jamie was mentioning, last year we we're sending out maps to communities, and this year we hope to incorporate more of this type of information. So you'll have a better idea what the rate of spread and things like that could be uh, in some of the key areas around communities. And so there's all these um, these ones here, and then there's a whole series of advanced outputs that look at the rate of spread, fuel consumption, but this is now just a publicly available tool. And again, with all the data you can see on Lightship, you can use uh, this to get a pretty good understanding of what wildfires might do uh, in and around communities. And so uh, what Wayne tells us here, and just to save a bit of time, I'm just gonna fly over here instead of running uh, the forest again, but going to go over to the community hall now and then take a look at our uh, decision support robot who will give us a little bit more information about how to do some of the risk mapping uh, once this loads up here. It will uh, give us a nice layout of all the different types of risk maps that are coming up. Uh, it looks like it's taking its sweet time, so I'll just uh, skip on for convenience sake. Uh, but now we can uh, talk to some of the counselor here and, and learn a little bit more about fire mapping. Uh, so we're going to start off looking at the firm's data. Probably many people have seen the, uh, the firm's information before, but again, it's just one of the many data sets that we're pulling into Lightship all the time. So this one is going to tell us where all the hot spots are. You can do, look at it day by day, 24 hours, seven days, or set up a custom thing. And this information is being pulled in from the NASA satellites on a daily basis. So again, we basically try to pull this into our systems and use it in the most effective way possible. Um, one of those ways, it can be used in Lightship, but another interesting way is taking data from the firm site and you can actually integrate it into Google Earth super easy so you can get three-dimensional views of some of the fire. So you know you might be able to have a better idea of where it started, where 
in adjacent to cut blocks or different slope types that it might be. Uh, now that my Google Earth is opening up, I'm just going to turn on the hotspots that it's picked up. And as we can see, a bunch of holdover fires from the winter here. Maybe I'll uh, zoom in uh, up in the north area here. Uh, we can take a look at this one quickly. But basically with the uh, Google Earth tool, you can add in those NASA hotspots, tilt it on three, three degree angles and have a pretty good understanding about how it's gonna move through valleys or how it might change direction uh, based on topography, wind speed and things like that. Uh, lastly, then taking us into the finesse map, um, we'll open up Lightship again via this link. And this is the wildfire overview map that we put out there and communities are able to look at it uh, all throughout the summer. And of course, all throughout the year as well, uh, being that communities can access this platform and uh, our resources for free. Uh, right now, we just have a map of the reserves in the province, but I'm going to turn on that NASA hotspot layer so we can start to see where the last week of points have been picked up. Some of these are holdover fires, some are logging blocks being burnt. I know Kelowna uh, recently was doing some uh, mitigation work and burning piles. And all of those get picked up in the system so we can get a better idea where some of those wildfires are. But then layering on other information like the current fires from last year, uh, the fire perimeters, just putting together different pieces of the puzzle, we can get a pretty good understanding of where some of the fires uh, might be burning the hottest or potentially causing the most impact. Just going to zoom in a little bit. Uh, since the my other my one screen didn't show up there, uh, one of the things that we do in the summer is to turn on these different layers and then uh, with the uh, with the mapping data start intersecting other values so maybe pick this uh, this one here and basically uh, what we do in the summer is just turn on these layers like water features adding in contour lines and then being able to provide communities with many different types of maps to show some of the values in relation to the wildfire so those were water types, but it's say if we wanted to look at forest harvesting in and around the wildfire or how old fire perimeters intersected with the wildfire. These are just all layers in the system and the finesse tool would allow you communities to quickly navigate some of this stuff in real time during emergencies. Um, last season, we had uh, one gentleman from Adams, like the former fire chief, Mike, uh, basically say having this data available to him made him feel like he was a leader out there and basically was able to direct the regional district around uh, just because he had more accurate, more up-to-date information than they were giving uh, their folks out in the field. And so that's the whole point of this Lightship tool is just to give you the best possible information. What I did now is turn on the BC Road Atlas so we can see all the Forest Service roads, all the highways, all the back roads, and things like that that have been picked up by GeoBC. And so understanding where all the roads are in the province, understanding where the social service facility centers are, we can create evacuation maps and use data and information in really exciting, uh, innovative ways. So that's uh, lots going on in the Lightship platform. What I'll do here is just pop back into the game quickly. And the last part of this first challenge is running over to Elder Mary and actually cleaning out the community firebox so that we ourselves can get a ax and then actually go and do the fire smart mitigations. Now that we've learned how to assess risk, now that we've learned how to, or built up the team a little bit to do some of the work, we can actually get out there and start um, basically putting our investment, human investment into the landscape to reduce the risk. Uh, just in this game, simply chopping away the trees uh, around the buildings will help to fire smart all the buildings. Again, for time, I'm, I'm simplifying things and flying around. Uh, but if you mitigate all the trees and then start the fires, the buildings survive. If you don't do the mitigations, well, then the buildings catch on fire. So I hope through this presentation, I was able to show you a lot of the cool things that we're working on, ways that we're interacting with data and trying to get it to communities in a timely, succinct way. Um, maybe I'll stop there for, for any questions just to not take up too much time. I know we're getting to the end. Any, uh, <clears throat> any quick questions uh, people have on that? And and uh, all the contact information has been put in the chat, uh, Jamie, decision support and whatnot. And uh, decision support um, is quite responsive if people have one-off questions for them pertaining to their community. 
Thank you for that, Brendan. Um, good information as always. I'm always learning every time I listen. Moving along, um, I'd like to introduce Carrie Ann from BGC, who's going to present on post wildfire hazards. We can see your screen. Thanks. Uh, I do not have a video game. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to do death by PowerPoint for a few minutes here. Um, Brendan, you, your brain amazes me every time we talk about these things. Um, I'm going to talk about after the wildfire occurs and some of the concerns um, and seeing some of the increased hazards following a wildfire. I have just a few very brief kind of comments about it, and I'm happy to chat with folks. Um, and I'll provide my contact information in the chat here. Uh, we're going to talk about what happens to a landscape following a wildfire, some types of hazards that are really common, and how to both assess and mitigate against these hazards, and then how long your community needs to monitor the persistence of these hazards. And really what the fundamental issues are following a wildfire is the hydrology of these watersheds are changed. So how the water is interacting with the trees, with the soil, and all the different ecosystems that uh, were present prior to a wildfire. And when I'm talking about this, I'm really talking about severe wildfires. So things that burn completely the trees and not some of those lower intensity burns or perhaps cultural burns that are done that don't damage the vegetation and the soil as much. So really these hot and intense burns. So when you get these hot and intense burns, you're both losing the tree canopy but you're also burning the soil structures themselves. And so after that wildfire, you get a quicker response typically from rainfall, but also from snow melt. And so you can see increases in uh, rain kind of falling on the surface, and then you get a lot more water coming off than is typically used to. And one of the communities that I work with kind of describes it as the water or the ground isn't drinking the water that it way that it used to. So it's a very different change in the landscape and some of the behaviors. And the image there that you can see on the right is uh, some of the sediment movement that we saw following the Lytton fire uh, in 2021. And those bright areas are where sediment has moved on the landscape. And this was just a couple months after the fire had uh, moved through that area. So in terms of what your community might be affected by following a wildfire, um, we're looking at a few different kinds of things. So either post wildfire debris floods or floods. And the graph there that you can kind of see the, the visual of what might happen in a flood. So the black is kind of that pre-fire, you know, the, the floods they're used to, either with snow melt or perhaps with uh, winter rainfall. And then following a wildfire, we tend to see a shift so that flooding is earlier in the season and perhaps larger than it used to be. And then every time a rainfall occurs, you also get a very large spike in the flood itself. And so that tends to be sort of, you know, for the first few years to decade following a wildfire, but we also see things like increased sediment loads uh, and this image that you can see here, it's a very, uh, this is with uh, near Vernon with the Okanagan Indian Band. So their community affected by that. And while lots of floods are kind of that dirty brown color, uh, you really do see that increased sediment coming through the channel during these floods. We also see changes in the channel banks. And so for several years following a wildfire, you might see the channels move around a lot and get a lot of bank erosion occurring downstream of the wildfire scar. And a lot of that has to do with how much more water is moving quickly through the system, as well as that sediment in there as well. Um, so a lot of the work that I've been focused on the past couple of years is looking at post wildfire debris flows. And for those that aren't familiar, uh, a debris flow is kind of similar to wet concrete moving at the speed of a car and, and capable of transporting house sized boulders. And the image that you're seeing here is um, from the Lytton fire and uh, for scale there, that's a, an 18 wheeler that was impacted up to about the driver's side door by debris as they were traveling through that area. So they can be very fast. Uh, the time between the rainfall occurring and the debris flow coming down can be within seconds to minutes. And so they can occur usually with very little warning. And they can cause significant channel erosion. So you might see a stream that used to be sort of kind of broad become very V-shaped and incised, 
following these debris flows. And then for a lot of concerns with communities in terms of ecology is they can introduce large volumes of sediment and debris into the, some of their major stream networks. And I'll touch on that a little bit later in terms of the ecological function. So what happens following a wildfire is there's risks to uh, your community as you're in the state of sort of recovering and trying to address what's next. So that might be for uh, people, maybe from those debris flows, uh, that might be the housing or your infrastructure networks. We also have losses or changes to the stream function and processes. And the image that you're seeing here is um, we worked with the Pacific Salmon Foundation to begin to talk about strategies for recovery following a wildfire. And you can see the illustrations here, you know, it's introducing large sediment or large volumes of sediment to the channels. Uh, you've also got lots of woody debris that's introduced in certain areas. And then downstream of that, you might get bank erosion occurring, you might get increased sediment deposition, and in the water itself, you're also looking at increased suspended sediment as well. So there's a variety of sort of knock-on effects following that wildfire. It's not just the fire itself, but it's all the sediment that's being introduced and the changes in the hydrology. We are also looking at sort of compound and cumulative damages. So we've also seen where wildfires or perhaps fire guards are influencing some of the changes in some of the stream flows, uh, as many of our resource roads aren't really designed to uh, handle that sort of increased runoff following a wildfire. So the options for your communities um, following a wildfire, uh, typically the post wildfire assessments are done through the BC Ministry of Forests. So when a major wildfire occurs as quickly as possible, uh, following containment of the wildfire, they're going to go out and do a reconnaissance assessment. So see how severely the fire has burned and if there's any elements at risk downslope of those. And in most wildfires that have major risks to those communities, they'll recommend a detailed assessment. And that's typically done by consultants like myself, but the ministry in uh, sort of low fire years might do them themselves. And then they're, they're going to describe all of the risks to, to the different uh, assets within the community, but tend to focus mostly on life loss. So where are the homes that are exposed to those post wildfire floods or debris flows? Uh, we have seen nations and communities beginning to undertake their own assessments. And that's typically because uh, these detailed assessments can sometimes take up to three months. Um, and it's a little bit hard for communities to plan recovery and, and bringing people back into their homes when they've got to wait a fairly long time to do that. So some communities have, have asked and requested and received funding from EMCR to undertake their own assessments so they can begin the recovery planning process. And then we're also seeing some emerging work on what's called pre-fire post-wildfire assessments. So rather than waiting for a wildfire to come through your community, um, examining how the landscape and the risks might change by pretending that a wildfire burns your community watersheds. And so looking at increases in flows or sediment and how that might affect your community's infrastructure. Um, so you can kind of begin to design that and maybe think about resiliency in a future changing climate. And then the last one I'll, I'll touch on here is um, options to reduce some of these hazards. So uh, the image that you're seeing there on the right, that's a, an engineered, uh, you know, we had some input on the design of this, but it's an uncompacted berm. Uh, and channel conveyance following a major debris flow that impacted a community. Um, so you can kind of construct these engineered structures to protect uh, your assets, but you might also do things like non-engineered um, reduction strategies. So that might be not recommending people not occupy certain houses, uh, looking at community outreach and education, or perhaps conducting some policy, uh, building policy zones in some of those rebuild areas and making them more resilient to these kinds of events moving forward. Um, and then the question that's kind of perplexing me these days is how long do these post wildfire hazards persist? And we really don't have good answers yet. Uh, we know that most post wildfire debris flows occur within about the first five years following a wildfire. Um, but this change in hydrology in the watersheds that can persist for more than a decade. And it's really dependent on how fast the vegetation recovers following that wildfire. And the comments earlier about, you know, influencing some of the landscape or replanting the landscape. So some of those restoration initiatives, and especially about increasing the diversity within the replanting, 
um, will help promote that recovery, that hydrologic recovery in the watershed. But in places where we haven't seen success in that either naturally or going in and intervening, uh, we've seen sometimes several decades. And the graph that you're seeing here is a project that I've been working on to look at the impacts of both the historic wildfires and the 2021 atmospheric river and showing that even 25 year old wildfire scars uh, had increased hazards when compared to their unburnt uh, neighboring catchments. So they can persist for a very long time and it's something that to think about for your community's sort of resiliency and recovery moving forward. So quick overview of those, but I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or I'll put my uh, contact in the chat here and then the slide decks will be passed around um, by Casey at the end. Thank you. Any, um, <clears throat> any really brief, quick questions for Carrie Ann before we do our final topic of the uh, session? And thank you so much, Carrie Ann. That's great information as always. And it's okay if not, um, Carrie Ann will put her uh, contact information in the chat and we will circulate a copy of the presentation. Thank you everyone for being so patient. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground with a lot of participants. Um, the final one is funding sup and supports provided, and that would be uh, EMCR and, and ISC. Um, which of you two gentlemen would like to go first? maybe EMCR? Sure. Yeah, happy to. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just uh, checking that you're able to hear me. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so it's Pierre McDonald, uh, Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, uh, Southwest Regional Manager. Thanks very much for inviting uh, EMCR to present information. Uh, the purpose here, just providing a brief overview of uh, regional operational supports. Happy to uh, share the deck later and answer any questions. <clears throat> um, just this first slide just reinforces the idea that emergency management is a shared responsibility really strengthened through partnerships. Uh, Juan touched upon that and uh, he's so right. Uh, there's really various levels of support available. Um, just illustrating that no one person or organization can respond uh, alone and certainly ind indigenous knowledge and leadership has much to contribute to uh, our improvement of emergency management and the problem solving strategies our communities develop and increasingly uh, utilize uh, for it. the pro yep um were you intending on sharing a deck at all oh am i not no oh i'm sorry sorry for interrupting my apologies Perfect. we can Is see it you now Okay, so so sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so um, here at uh, the province, uh, before disaster strikes, uh, we'll activate the BC emergency management structure and support local emergency operation centers during emergencies. Um, particularly here at the Preox, the provincial regional emergency operations center. There's there's six across the province and we particularly focus on response, just helping local authorities uh, or supporting them at the local level. Um, certainly local authorities uh, and regional districts are required to have an emergency plan in place uh, for high risk hazards and uh, encouraged to practice those. Um, they do have primary responsibility within their jurisdiction. Uh, for emergency management, which requires uh, an emergency program and uh, integrated plans with neighboring communities. And then, of course, uh, there's individuals uh, and other partners, including critical infrastructure uh, owners, NGOs, private sector volunteers, and federally too. So just really together, we, we uh, must encourage and support each other to continually develop our emergency management capabilities and capacity. Um, here, the emergency management cycle, I'm just going to skip this one, uh, but of course, uh, when we speak about emergency management, we're um, involving all four phases of the emergency management cycle, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Uh, at the regional offices, our, our goal is to communicate uh, closely and develop relationships with the communities in our regions uh, and the agencies servicing them. 
So regional managers are our point of contact as a communications and a resources link um, for a wide network of partners, including all levels of government and Indigenous nations, uh, industry, NGOs, and um, volunteers. And we work to help to coordinate the, uh, the awareness and access to our regional and provincial level supports. Uh, we also work to receive and distribute information internally and externally to improve situational awareness and uh, help and obtain and deploy resourcing and messaging as required. So timely monitoring and providing of the information is really crucial. So when our partners provide information of relevance uh, for emergency managers and practitioners in our regions, we will distribute that information, broadcast emails and post and coordination calls. Um, for example, uh, as emergency events arise or, or prior to uh, various seasons, uh, when there's common hazards to be expected, uh, we'll coordinate a regional coordination call for all First Nations and local authorities to call in and listen to the, the subject matter experts and then uh, provide uh, feedback and engage in some discussion. So that two-way communication really helps to develop uh, a regional awareness and perspective that uh, informs both local and uh, executive decision-making and uh, the continual improvement of our emergency management response. For localized emergency response events, uh, local authorities and First Nations engaged in an emergency should uh, request a task number through the Emergency Coordination Center. That, uh, that task number enables the uh, provincial government to manage information about all the emergencies happening in the province. So it's really critical for the local authority or community to reference that number when uh, submitting uh, an expenditure authorization form known as an EAF or a resource request or a response claim. <laughs> Um, there is a financial assistance guidelines document that's available for all communities to consult to understand what response and recovery costs are eligible. But uh, please keep in mind as well that regional managers at, uh, at the PREOX can help support communities with um, submission processes by clarifying questions regarding eligible expenses. Uh, it must be stated that there, there can be some ambiguity with the lack of extra detail uh, in, in the financial assistance guidelines. Uh, this flexibility, though, can enable the legislation to work as intended, meaning to help those most in need. So um, it's in the interest of every local authority and community to, to check assumptions about response costs uh, that the province considers eligible, especially dealing with large cost items and to confirm if the province will assist with the uh, ambiguous or extraordinary or other uh, expenses, um, the community's EOC can submit an EAF uh, to the PREOC uh, prior to an expense being incurred. Um, and uh, once the EAF is submitted, it's uh, reviewed and authorized uh, by the, the PREOC uh, and then the community is uh, assured that the province will uh, provide that assistance to the amount specified. And the financial reimbursement is provided after submission of a response claim that details uh, the expenses incurred and paid. Uh, under the BC Emergency Management System, communities uh, are responsible for using local resources to fill immediate needs to the greatest extent possible. Um, those resources include uh, goods and equipment and personnel, but if locally available resources are insufficient uh, for operational needs, then the um, local authority or community can request further assistance uh, to uh, either from another local authority uh, or through the PREOC. And, when, um, and to do that, uh, a resource request can be uh, submitted. And just that request just needs to include the justification for the request, as well as any other pertinent information and the signature of the EOC uh, director. And uh, once that's emailed to the PREOC, then uh, we receive and process it right away. Following response activities, communities receive the, the financial reimbursement 
acquire those eligible response costs through the submission of a response claim uh, to EMCR. Um, regional managers can help uh, to answer any questions communities may have about uh, the correct forms and processes. Um, there's some steps there. I'm not going to go into those, but just please note that regional managers are very happy to meet with uh, the EPCs and finance personnel at communities whenever requested uh, to review the process and provide any required training to new staff just to ensure that the uh, response claim processes and forms are understood and uh, sent in with the uh, required documentation to, to expedite processing. Uh, for major events, communities traditionally use different methods to communicate life-saving information, uh, whether door-to-door -door sirens, traditional media, or online communications. Uh, also, there's now mass notification systems um, like Alertable. Um, however, uh, in a situation where a community has identified an immediate risk to the safety of its members and urgent notification is required, Broadcast intrusive alerting can be uh, requested through the Emergency Coordination Center, the ECC. Uh, those broadcast intrusive alerts interrupt TV and radio programs and mobile, mobile devices. It's, it's a one-way push message, um, and it's used for when there's immediate life safety uh, situations. Um, it's, it's, it's different than the mass notification systems. Uh, like Alertable or Connect Rocket, where people sign up for a service and download an, an app for those ones. Uh, for those other mass notification systems, receivers can decide what information they receive. Um, and the local community can also share a broad range of public information uh, since they uh, operate and manage it themselves. But uh, please note uh, that for a broadcast intrusive alert to be issued, the following criteria must be met. There must be lives or public safety at risk, and the public needs to take immediate action, and critical life-saving information will be provided. An, ac an evacuation order is in place, or it's about to be put in place, and the area to be alerted is within the, uh, the jurisdiction of the community. The process uh, for the broadcast of intrusive alert is to phone the emergency coordination center. Uh, the caller will tell the dispatcher they want to send out the broadcast intrusive alert about, uh, for example, a wildfire. And then the caller will provide details in an emergency alert submission form. If there's no time to fill out that form in advance, the caller can just tell the dispatcher what area and the community is in danger and the information that needs to go to the public. Uh, the caller will need to confirm their identity, those message details and the geographic boundary. And as part of uh, the follow-up call with partner agencies, the ECC will contact the EMCR regional manager just to confirm the caller's identity. And then that alert is sent out to wireless devices, radios and TV in the impacted area. And uh, the broadcast intrusive alert, it's in effect for four hours until it's uh, canceled or updated. Uh, during emergencies and disasters, whole neighborhoods or communities uh, might need to be evacuated uh, to an emergency support services uh, ESS host community. And sometimes those communities might be unfamiliar with uh, the needs required to support evacuees from another community. So they might lack the knowledge uh, of the evacuees' culture or protocols. And to support evacuees, the, the host uh, or the evacuating community may utilize a community navigator. Uh, this is an eligible uh, cost supported by EMCR. Um, the, the use of uh, the navigator can support evacuees by connecting those evacuees with supports maybe not commonly offered uh, in an, an ESS reception center or a lodging facility. Um, so that community navigator uh, ensures that the service delivery is aligned with First Nations perspectives on health and wellness and cultural safety. Um, it, it supports cultural safety and, and humility during evacuations. Um, the, that navigator role also just provides assurance that um, 
First Nations evacuees will be heard and respected and, and have their needs met. Uh, often this person is someone known to community members, uh, would likely have intimate knowledge of the community and its cultural practice protocols. Um, and it's up to the community to, to choose the source uh, for, their, for their navigator. Uh, often this can be within the, within the community or possibly a support agency such as FNHA or a community uh, health society um, so that it a, is a, another cost uh, eligible for reimbursement. Um, another policy of interest is, is uh, with respect to cultural activity location support, large scale evacuations that impact entire community. Um, can certainly be very stressful and traumatizing. So it's important to provide trauma-informed and culturally appropriate services to lessen those, those impacts and, and help with the transition into recovery. And so those services can be offered uh, within or, or close to the ESS reception center um, with uh, a cultural activity location uh, support. Um, Please note that, that this is a, a designated gathering space determined, the location is determined by the community, um, re really just to uh, support uh, the health, wellness, and, uh, and um, cultural uh, required services um, to, to evacuees. So it's a, it's a space, safe space where evacuees can gather and access uh, cultural care and uh, services. Um, I'll leave that one there and just move on to MASS, the multi-agency support hey, uh, team. Peter, yep. um, do, do you know how much longer you'll need? I'm, I think I'm allowed an extra 15 or 20 minutes uh, with my account, but I'm just doing okay. a time check-in. Uh, two minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, just just wanting to know uh, that uh, um, EMCR works with, uh, with our partners, Finesse, uh, FNHA, EMCR, and S to... Uh, collaborate on face-to-face uh, -face meetings with uh, communities. Um, really just uh, we were able to uh, connect uh, when an emergency happens to support, uh, to, to ensure that the support for a community is co-developed and approved by the impacted Indigenous community, uh, fully in alignment with uh, self-determination cultural uh, safety. Um, that face-to-face -face support can can occur either with a short-term meeting or visit with the Indigenous uh, leaders or, or senior leaders within communities, or also we can help integrate uh, in uh, the local emergency operations center. Lastly, uh, sometimes this question comes up, who do we contact first? Uh, EMCR, is Finesse, FNHA, or other partners. Uh, for us, the short answer is just contact the Emergency Coordination Center, ask to speak with the regional duty manager. We're always on call 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. And uh, in, an emergency, in, an, in an emergency situation event, uh, we wanna quickly connect with the nation and then we'll help to coordinate support and communications as required uh, with, uh, with our partners. And I'll just end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's a lot of good information. Um, maybe we'll combine the questions for both your presentation and ISC. And I'd like to turn it over to the ISC representative if there's anything you would like to briefly present. And thank everyone for being so patient. Yeah, hi, Casey. Um, I'll do the presentation. Let me share my screen. You see that? We can. Perfect. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so good afternoon-ish time. Um, my name is Yannick Lapierre. I work uh, for Indigenous Service Canada, and I'm a program advisor for Vancouver Island and Coastal Region. Um, so I've been, I've been with ISC for um, almost two years now, um, and uh, it's been... Uh, it's been great working here. So just some of the program highlights. I'm going to do it really quickly because I know you don't have that much time, uh, Casey. Uh, and I, I'm sure you guys have seen this before. But um, so there's, uh, there's a variety of activities that uh, Indigenous Service Canada 
does provide um, for First Nations um, emergency management. Um, just so it's clear, the Government of Canada or Indigenous Service Canada does not prov do any make any decisions for on reserve emergencies. Um, we are there to support the community and support organizations that um, are trying to assist the community in their response and recovery. Um, so we have kind of here's some of the program highlights. So um, in the response activities, um, we do um, provide funding for um, short term effects uh, from emergencies, uh, response activities. And for recovery, we also provide funding for um, um, for activities that restore um, homes, uh, communities, uh, infrastructure, that kind of stuff that were impacted by uh, natural hazards um, and conduct and, and uh, create an emergency. Uh, we also have another program or another part of a program that does non-structural mitigation and preparedness. These are uh, more applications uh, based and uh, where communities can provide funding or can can be provided funding uh, to to do a variety of activity under um, non-structural mitigation preparedness, like emergency management plan, uh, hazard assessments, um, training, and um, small um, equipment. Um, also providing funding for um, FireSmart to finesse. There's also funding for capacity enhancement. So there's 13 positions right now that are funded um, in BC for um, EPCs. And it's usually uh, conglomerate, like uh, multiple nations coming together to uh, hire emergency management uh, program coordinators. Um, and yeah, there's 13 in, in province. And then we also provide uh, First Nation led initiatives. So, in, you know, provide um, EMAP funding for um, emergency management activities. Uh, in this case, we have, for example, Finesse that does provide Fire Smart. So, um, and for that, um, the example that given is, for example, provided $5.5 million in search funding um, to finesse to support um, uh, the enhanced capacity of First Nation in preparedness, mitigation, and response activities. Um, so as I said, uh, in response, uh, we don't have any on the ground assets. We do not provide any decisions, but we do are there to support uh, communities uh, in their response activities uh, through funding uh, and also through um, our network with EMCR and Finesse and, and other organizations. Um, we, there's certain funding that, um, and it's not just for wildfire, but other fire, uh, other types of emergencies. Um, that the province may not be able to reimburse. Um, and so we work with the First Nation, to see, with the community to see if we may be able to fund it. I have one that I'm working on right now so that I'm aware of um, that happened where the province was not was not eligible to to provide funding for, for that, but, but ISC was able to. And for all of the, all of the on-reserve, um, activities that happen due to emergencies, response and recovery. Um, fin uh, ISC does provide funding um, to, to finesse or to uh, to finesse and to um, EMCR for for those activities. So uh, we do evacuate support, um, and also in terms of recovery, we work with First Nation communities to provide uh, recovery funding. Um, for um, for the impact that happened on their on, on reserve on community, and that includes um, a build back better approach. Also, so we can provide additional funding in comparison to for the for example DFA, where it has to be back to the the normal or the precondition, the pre uh, the pre the, the pre emergency. Um, we can provide a build back better approach. So um, yeah, so that's another one. In terms of uh, non-structural mitigation preparedness, um, as I, I was saying, you know, you, you can provide um, emergency management plan, uh, funding for emergency management plan, all hazard risk assessment, and uh, wild, 
wildfire prevention and preparedness, like Fire Smart, um, and other activities. This also includes small um, small equipment, uh, less than five thousand dollar equipment, and we are working um, to try to enhance that a little bit more. Um, see what we can do with that. Uh, I'm just going to skip a bit of this, but some of the activities, for example, this is across Canada. So 2014, 2015, there were 16 projects for non-structural mitigation and preparedness. And in 2018 or 2019, 2020, we had over 150 projects um, across the country. I don't, I don't know what the numbers are for the years after that, but I know there's lots. Um. Yeah, really in the response and recovery, we're there to provide funding streams uh, to First Nations. So in response, it's often reimbursement um, to organizations or to the communities themselves uh, for uh, activities or for actions that they did on reserve to try to protect their, um, their community. Uh, in terms of reimbursement, um, we, we work uh, with the community to um, uh, for for recovery uh, after the emergency itself, and these things, as you guys are all very aware of, um, takes can take years. So, um, so yeah, really providing uh, support to First Nation throughout the full recovery process. Uh, this example here is from Lytton. Uh, from the 2021 uh, wildfire. So um, providing, I believe these, I, I, it's not one of the project I worked on, but I believe this, these are, these were uh, temporary housing that were provided on reserve until um, um, homes were either rebuilt um, or reconstructed or, or repaired. Uh, fire smart program. Um, Going to go skip that real quick because finesse is a, uh, is on that and a lot um and we've had some presentation about that already today so yeah so uh if there's any further questions uh or contact information so um the the first one here is our uh duty um you know, do box or duty officer box uh, that is not monitored all the time it's monitored during um more active season uh, for fire especially so over the summer last summer for example um, it was activated for for the whole time. Otherwise, it's monitored um, Friday, Monday to Friday from eight to four, eight to five, um, and then the, this is the phone number for the for the duty officer phone that uh, that is shared across uh, during that those fire activation time. Or yeah, um, here's my phone number here uh, with my name and uh, in my email address. So this is for the communities. Uh, on Vancouver Island and, and coastal region that, that wish to um, talk to me directly, um, I'm available anytime by email, really easy, uh, Monday to Friday uh, during office hours. And also the other program advisors, they can also be reached through the uh, the, the DO box. So the DO box gets monitored. And if we receive an email from a community in from our region and they don't know how to contact us, they'll, they'll forward the email to us. So... That's um, one. And then the, here's the contact information for my director at the bottom. Uh, her name is Laura Okoy, and she's the director of emergency management and her email address and her phone number there. So uh, we can be reached any day, any, you know, um, if it's not an emergency, again, we're not the first um, contact information or the, the first contact for, for emergencies. Um, I leave that more to uh, the EMCR folks. But uh, if there's some questions about funding or, um, or providing additional information of what the what can be provided that for funding on reserve that may not have may no be, may not be eligible uh, for uh, provincial um, refund or reimbursement, then uh, be more than happy to talk to you guys about that. And yeah, that's that's what I have. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Thanks. And in the chat, uh, I put in that the finesse playlist has recordings and materials from previous information sessions, including the the one last fall on federal emergency management programming. 
um, really good information. Uh, we're at the 1230 mark. I see one hand raised, Paul McCarthy. Hey, thanks, uh, Casey. Uh, just just a couple of questions or with the new emergency management legislation coming in and, and the focus being on the other pillars of emergency management, basically preparation and response, um, is this looking at that model or are we still leaning into the recovery and response end of things? Because the the Emergency Management Act for BC references the Sendai report, which basically says an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. For every $2 you spend on a response, you'll save six and or two dollars we spend on on uh, preparation will save six in response, and and is there any thought or appetite to look at a long term funding model to to properly support the four pillars of emergency management within in First Nation because we saw that which Casey put it in the, the chat we saw that one year funding grant for the EPCs that's gone now, um so it's really hard for the for a lot of these communities and a lot of these nations to build sustainable programs um, where everything seems to kind of be hit or miss and we're not really leaning into preparation and and mitigation we're, we're still talking on the response dollars end of the end of the house you're on mute yannick Hi, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's not something that we control here in the region. It's something that we have to work with Ottawa in terms of Treasury Board and and the, the, their their you know minister decisions and that kind of stuff because they are long term uh, funding and um, require you know a lot a lot of money. We're talking because whatever we do here in Brit in British Columbia, we have to be able to. Uh, do similarly across the, across the country. So I know there's other regions in the country that have funding for EPCs, for example, and I don't know if they're on a year to year basis or if they're a long term, um, but it is something that we are aware of and that we've been um, providing our feedback to uh, executive um, uh, executive directors and um, and, and deputy ministers and ministers. Uh, and it's also something that was highlighted in the Auditor General's report um, that uh, that funding should be provided to for emergency program coordinators across the country because there's not a standard um, currently right now, and and it is something that's severely lacking. And and that's just basic. I'm not even talking that that's mitigation. That's that's just basic funding um, that um, that should be there. So. And in terms of the four pillars, we, we do fund uh, structural mitigation under a community infrastructure. Uh, we also fund mitigation and preparedness and recovery and response. The recovery and response funding is um, is is a lot larger than what is available for preparedness and mitigation. Um, but that's just how we've always done emergency management and I'm not saying it's a, it's, it's the good way of doing it, but, um, but we know that cost is extremely expensive in evacuations and, um, and recovery, um, you know, spending millions and millions of dollars for, for repair of homes or rebuilding of homes. So it's very expensive stuff. So it should, um, you know, mitigation and preparedness requires a more of a, a larger approach with the province, the you know, working with provincial government and working with with other nations and municipalities in the area that um, that that might be required, especially if talking about you know river floods and and full fires. Um, so so you know we're we're we are working with finesse to try to provide enhanced capacity for for First Nation organization to 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 provide you know. Fire smart, for example, in terms of mitigation and preparedness for communities, and to be able to deliver that um, to the nations in BC. So, I'll have to say I'm not trying to skirt the question, but yeah, it's uh, it's something that we are talking about. It's something that we've been like in BC region that we are providing um, to to our executives, and they're aware that this is important and that that needs to happen. And yeah, we we need to. Uh, 100% need to uh, to figure that out because um, 
it's yeah it's severely needed yeah, especially in bc thanks thanks yannick do you uh do you have like a couple of examples of areas where they might be funding epcs in in the country just so we might be able mm -hmm. to reach out and network with them just yeah, so we um, have give our leadership some some more information when they need to to go forward with this if i remember correctly i believe uh saskatchewan has um epcs that are being funded by um by isk it's either saskatchewan or alberta for sure that that have if not all of them almost all of them but i'm pretty sure it's all of them um and usually what they do and this is it's similarly in, in in this province too when i talked about the um the capacity enhancement where we provide um funding for 13 epcs across the the the, the province is uh it's it's a it's a it's a group of nations coming together. So in Saskatchewan or Alberta, it's uh, they they fund uh, at the at the tribal council level. So not the individual nations, but um, at the um, you know treaty one, treaty two, they'll they'll fund uh, positions within within those treaty nations within those treaties um, to to provide emergency management services to to the nations that fall under that treaty. So um, so yeah, it's. I want to say Saskatchewan, but it's it's either one of those two. And I'm not sure if Ontario does also. I'm I'm not not familiar enough. I'd, I'd have to reach out to my colleagues. Yeah, Casey, maybe Yannick, you could uh, email me a bit more information, and I can share that with the uh, the presentation, the recording. I'm mindful of the time. It's twelve thirty six. Uh, hopefully, we can wrap up in the next four minutes. Uh, Juan, I see your hand raised. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I regret the fact that um, we didn't have enough time to properly ask questions to our friends from uh, EMCR and Indigenous Service Canada. But I would like to make a comment, and uh, the comment has to do with the fact that uh, there is a need, I believe, uh, to simplify the funding process. Uh, organizations are passing the back this is not collaboration, it's passing the back and passing the responsibility from one department to the other. We don't have that information, Janik, that we could use in terms of uh, analyzing how much the, the federal government of Canada transferred to the province for services provided to us. I would like to have access to that. Thank you very much. To emergency management and climate readiness, um, I wonder if uh, you are working on uh, developing uh, new regulations. Uh, we have a new act. I wonder if uh, there's going to be new regulations guiding uh, the financial assistance uh, guide. Uh, right now, your financial assistance system is suffocating First Nation communities. We cannot get reimbursement for making use of a space your uh, incremental costs are, are, are pretty close to being um, uh, racist in, in a sense because of the way that they're administered. Um, for example, uh, if I was working on a municipality, I can, I can uh, get reimbursed for the use of a space. In uh, the case of a person nation community, we make use of a space during an emergency, and uh, we cannot be we cannot receive any reimbursement because those are considered to be banned assets. The buildings are considered to be banned assets. Well, the bank do, don't own those assets. The assets are owned by the bank, and the only way that the community can survive is by charging for the use of that space. So there is there is a clear need that to simplify the funding process and make it more in line with uh, regional districts or, or other ways of uh, funding, particularly uh, the way that the industry is funded. Uh, industry doesn't have any problem uh, putting uh, uh, big pieces of equipment on uh, on the line and getting paid uh, very generously. Uh, as uh, Mr. Robert Cosmas was pointing out, uh, that's not the same situation for First Nation communities. So 
we have been treated differently. And I, for one, am getting a bit annoyed at the fact that, that we are not treated equally and that we are not putting the resources where the resources are needed. I think that there is a need for a, a long conversation regarding that. Thank you, Juan, for sharing that. Um, Yannick or Peter, would you like to do a super brief response before we conclude the session? Sure. Uh, just really thank you very much, uh, Juan, for uh, that feedback. I'll make sure that it is communicated to our executive and uh, yep, certainly echo the sentiments and just want to assure you that uh, this is being uh, looked at. Uh, can't speak with regards to the regulations as our policy and ledge uh, team are working on those right now, but I can uh, certainly follow up and uh, I'd uh, appreciate uh, connecting with you later and uh, following up with concerns to ensure that uh, um, your questions are answered and really appreciate uh, you sharing your experience and concerns. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Yannick. Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, mm. transparency and clarity in, in what is provided to uh, EMCR for for uh, for funding, for providing services, uh, I don't have the number for because I know uh, it provides funding for certain positions within EMCR to uh, to enhance their capacity to be able to uh, deliver services for on reserve uh, nations. So I, I don't have that number. But and um and, and similarly, we also do reimbursement. So if you if if a First Nation provide a EAF uh, for, um, I'm I'm not sure. For example, um, a road, road clearance for something, um, and then the and then EMCR provides the funding to that. Then we will receive the invoice from EMCR. Uh, and then we'll provide funding. So that changes every year and it changes every season. And uh, every every quarter we receive um, uh, kind of uh, an amount of invoices from 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 EMCR that provides kind of a, a breakdown of which nation uh, funding was provided for and for how much and for what for what emergency. So, um, you know, uh, over the summer we had uh, heat waves and and some funding was provided for the opening of, um, of cooling centers from MCR through an EAF from First Nations. So it's provided funding for EMCR to, to, to provide that, that funding back to the community. So, um, so that, and, and that changes every single year, really depending on, on what, um, what the emergencies are, what the, the seasons are. So I, I, I have like, previous quarters and and these invoices come from a variety of, of years also so they they can go through their uh their, their accounts and see in 2018 2019 some money was funding for for fire uh response and then so we we provide funding for that so that changes every quarters i've i've seen you know two uh, two million dollar claims i've seen five hundred thousand dollar claims for for certain quarters um spending multiple years and, and multiple nations um, across the province. So it's it's really difficult for me to, to give you an actual number. Uh, I can try to find that um, and, um, and, you know, provide that, but um, yeah. yeah I mean, my question has to do with the fact that I haven't been able to find anywhere the information on a yearly basis. You're mm -hmm. talking about uh, invoices from a single community and those sort of things. That's not what I'm asking. I want to know, how much is the retainer that is a, a global retainer that is centered between the government of Canada and BC? And how much is the annual amount that BC, the federal government of Canada pays to BC for services being provided to us? I there must be a place and there need to be accountability as to how, what is the amount of money that is being transferred from one jurisdiction to the other on our name? And that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for you to let me know how much we invoice and we didn't receive back. No, mm -hmm. not the question. The question mm -hmm. is a global question. Because if we know that information, we can make, a, make up an argument saying we are not putting the amount of resources where those resources need to be allocated. 
Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll try to find that answer. Um, that would I've that would yeah, I'll... and that's that's what I understand. Uh, is a is a right and privilege of all citizens in uh, this great country, right? Yeah, yeah, it's so it, 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 access uh, access to that information, so that that we can we can start uh, talking to one another at a different level. Uh, I'm not asking for charity for my community. No, I'm asking sure. to yep. be a partner. I'm asking to be considered somebody that is uh, has the same goals and aspirations, and I want to contribute as much as you do to the better be, the betterment of the system. Yeah, correct, and and that's uh, that that transparency is is for all you know uh, all taxpayers uh, across the country. So it it is the information is some available somewhere, and it is it is open. So I just don't have that ex exact amount right now. Um, I was looking through the uh, the uh, departmental report. Port, uh, for ISK and I know they provide some some budgetary figures there I don't know if it's in there or not but um yeah I can I can find that information that's um uh, it, it should be available somewhere I'm super mindful of the time we're 46 minutes past so uh Paul unless it's uh extremely essential to ask your question if you could be super super quick and brief it's, it's and, uh... not a question real quick uh okay from other information I got, there's $3 million that goes from ISC to EMCR for staffing that supports 27 positions in the province. Um, and then I think Finesse gets around 10 million and then there's some other projects in that bucket of money as well. No question, thanks for the time. I really appreciate it, everybody. That's it for me, quiet now. Thank you so much. And, and my apologies, everyone. Uh, this was so important. The presentation, the information, uh, I think it's a lesson learned that maybe we'll uh, we'll look at how we do the start of the meeting and maybe put a bit of extra time for flood and for wildfire. Uh, my thanks to all the presenters, especially Juan and Serena from community. It's so important to hear from community, from title and rights holders. I uh, I, I I really respect the work that's being done uh, by each and every one of you. Uh, my thanks to everyone who took the time for staying so late in this, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, everyone.